Hi everyone and welcome back to COM1 Public Speaking Online. In this lesson we're going to be talking about audience analysis. What it is, how to do it, and even some special considerations that you need to take in this class. Then we'll end by me providing you some general speech tips for your upcoming speech. So what is audience analysis? The first thing that we need to think about is the fact that each audience is in fact unique and composed of very diverse members, as you suspect. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, wait, but Tara, I just watched your universal theme video and you said that we all share common experiences. And we do. That's true. Take, for example, love. If I were to ask my three-year-old about love, I'm sure the conversation would turn into things about ice cream or Legos, who knows, and uh, you know, maybe that's a commentary on my parenting. I'm not exactly sure. But if I were to ask an adult about love, I don't know, maybe they would talk about their romantic interests or their family, their friends, maybe their kids, their pets. Even today, maybe job security. They would love that, right? As a public speaker, we have to make strategic choices about the content of our speech as we use the universal themes so that we can really tailor it to our audience. Imagine, for example, that you are going to give a speech about public sex education to a room full of teenagers. Yikes. Now, that same speech would sound very different if you were giving it to a room full of doctors, their parents, religious members, and the like. You can imagine how different that speech would be depending on who's sitting in your audience. So how do we learn about our audience to really design our speeches with them in mind? Well, audience analysis is the practice of gathering cultural, demographic, but also conceptual data from and about your audience so that we can best prepare our speech with them in mind. Everything from the content to the presentation enhancer or visual aid and the ways that we decide to use our universal themes. And there's a couple ways we can do that. Given the proper time and resources, we could send out a poll or a questionnaire. And these would be great to get some data points. An interview would be even better because then maybe we could sit down or exchange texts or emails face-to-face -face or in a digital setting and truly learn about the members of our audience. Now, we might not have time to do all of that in this class, so what are we going to do? Well, another message or another method is simply to do some research, right? And the internet is a powerful source that would help us pick up on some research trends. For example, in social media, we can get really good information from social media trends and patterns on demographics in our local area, maybe even our state or a national level. We can also learn through some good research about cultural patterns that are really um, more situated within specific populations and learning communities. Sierra College has a lot of resources, for example, that would help us get to know one another. Now, another way that you could go about doing some audience analysis, as talked about in your book, are by making some guesses and assumptions. And believe me, I know that those words alone carry very negative connotations. Sometimes, though, the best that we can do is make a well-informed and educated guess, one that is considerate of our audience so as not to offend anyone sitting there. Now, we can guess, for example, about maybe ages, or we could think about the fact that if we're all in college, chances are that we've completed some high school, right? Again, if you're speaking to a room full of high school students, a proper assumption would be that maybe they've all completed middle school or general education classes, that they're between the ages of 14 and 18 and so on. So those are safe things to assume rather than to make assumptions about their personality traits, for example. 
Now, what audience demographic information do we need to know about each other in this room? You're not going to be giving speeches to each other in a live setting, but it would help to know a little bit about each other before just jumping straight into speeches. And we're going to get the opportunity to do that in a couple ways. First is through your discussion board assignments. You'll be asked to interact with one another through various discussion boards throughout the semester. And I suggest picking someone new each time that you can respond to. We also might have the opportunity to engage in peer reviews and peer feedback for our speeches, depending on how things go throughout the semester. So one thing you could do right now is start by writing down a couple questions that you think would be important to think about or consider as you plan your first speech. For example, how many of us are working full-time or part-time? How many of us have kids at home or are in a relationship? Did we want to take online classes this semester? Those are just a few examples. Now, there's some other things that we gotta to consider too when doing audience analysis. As we mentioned before, think about age. Right now, on the left hand side, you'll see demographics to think about and consider, and on the right, what you could do in your speech to avoid offending someone. So, the example I gave earlier was if you're talking to high school students, it would be safe to assume that they're 14 to 18 or that they've all completed middle school rather than coming up with a list of stereotypes or, for example, characteristics, personality traits that you might think high schoolers in your area have. We also need to be considerate of gender identities, religion, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, culture, and I could have continued this list in so many ways to include politics and even more. So here are some things that you can think about to avoid so that we don't fall into a trap of offending other people and instead help promote a safe learning environment in this class. Obviously, stereotyping. But what about male generic language? What is that? You might be asking yourself. Male generic language is any language that uses male as the default. So mailman, fireman, congressman. What might be some alternatives? Mail carrier, firefighter, those are non-male generic speech terms that we can use in place of male generic ones. Of course, we need to consider um, speech that might be considered um, prejudice or discriminatory for some, or that pushes or encourages um, ideologies around heteronormativity. Well, what is heteronormativity? Heteronormativity are language patterns or practices that situate heterosexuality as the societal or cultural norm. A good example of this might be when someone says, Hey everyone, I want you to think for a minute about your mom and dad. While well-intentioned, if I have two moms, or two dads, or only one mom, or no parent, I might be missing something. When thinking about race, ethnicity, culture, and the like, we also want to work to avoid cultural specific terms, things that you would have to be a local in order to know, and also anything that might be considered offensive in terms of racism or ethnocentrism. Now we know that tensions are high across the globe right now, so these are some good, healthy, safe practices that again, help us promote a really safe learning environment. So with that, let's go ahead and wrap up with some tips for your first speech. As I mentioned before, definitely consider the setting. Framing, lights, sounds, distractions, standing if possible. Though, be sure, I am happy to work with any accommodations that anyone might need. Finally, students ask a lot about attire. What do they need to wear for their speeches? Well, I think that if you think you look good and you feel good, then you'll give a good speech. So for me, attire is completely secondary to content and delivery skills. In other words, be comfortable so that you give a good speech and don't worry too much about speech attire. Make sure to prep any tech that you are planning on using, whether it be your recording device, your internet, your YouTube channel, and the like. 
Try to use only three by five or four by six cards, as mentioned before, and don't memorize your speech so that that way you don't feel so compelled to um, use all the words that you wrote down or memorized, but rather practice so you feel comfortable by picking some key phrases that you constantly go back to. If you're feeling nervous, go back to the reframing strategies. Breathe, do some yoga, take a good breath, listen to a nice song, imagine yourself delivering a confident speech, and hopefully that calms your nerves. Practice out loud. Oftentimes we speak a lot faster in our minds than we do out loud. So it's going to be important for your timing that you practice at least once or twice out loud. Though I might not suggest doing it in front of friends or family, I can hear that sometimes they're a little brutal. Consider your language use, as we mentioned, when it comes to audience considerations. And finally, plan ahead. Always have a, block, a backup plan in case all else fails. Thanks, and I hope that these tips were helpful. Be sure to contact me if you have any questions.